Hello, and welcome to Agrosa Physics. Today is day 68, and we're going to discuss power and horsepower today. Now, as we saw yesterday with the piano dilemma, no matter what way we got the object to the ramp, we did the same amount of work. Now, of course, this is an ideal situation where there's no friction involved. Of course, if you have friction, the longer ramp will have friction acting on it the entire time and probably require extra work to get it to the spot that you're trying to achieve. But in an ideal situation where friction is not involved, what we're going to find is that the work is independent of the path. If we get an object from point A to point B using different ramps or just lifting it versus gravity, we're going to do the same amount of work. Now, if the same amount of work is done, there has to be some term that allows us to rate which one is better than the other method. And that's where power comes in. And power is the rate at which work is done. And power is used in engines and cars and many things to denote how efficient the system can do work, or efficiently the system can do work. And what we have is a rate, which means it's divided by time. So the power equation is simply the work over time. So if we're going to do the same amount of work for all three situations with the piano problem, the one that can do it the fastest is going to have a greater power output. Now the power, if we have work as force times distance over time, can also be force times velocity. So the power can also figure out how fast an object's going to move if we're talking about things like elevators or even car motors. So it's going to allow us using power to figure out um, how quickly work is being done. Now, if work divided by time is our, uh, our equation, we need to figure out the units. And it's joules per second. And what we've done is come up with the watt as the unit for the power. So watts the unit for power. Exactly. And what we're going to do is um, use the watt, which is a capital W, to denote how efficiently the work is being done or how quickly the work is being done. The watt is um, simply a term of joules per second simplified. Now watch out, the W can be confused with other variables um, such as work and that will be something you have to watch out for. Is it a variable or is it a unit? Now it's not the same as kilowatt hours. Kilowatt hours are a unit of energy used in electrical systems. So when you pay for your electricity with your electric company, what you're actually doing is paying per kilowatt hour, which is not a power, but instead it's a unit of energy. So simply what we can do is figure out the work done, how long it took to do it, and divide the two. That gives us the power in watts. Now, watts will often have a uh, kilowatt in front of it, or megawatts, or prefixes that denote uh, multiples, or you know, tend to some power of watts being done. But remember, if that's the case, you're going to replace that, that letter with times 10 to whatever power it is, and then use that accordingly. But we have two versions of the power equation. It's work over time, or it's the force times velocity. So if you're looking for how fast something occurs, you're going to use the force times velocity. And if you're looking for um, work or something like that, you're going to use uh, work over time. Now that being said, the unit, the watt, is named for James Watt, who worked on the development of the steam engine. And what he was able to do is come up with a measurement of how strong his engine was compared with the most uh, common um, work device of the time. And at the time, the horse was the uh, not just for transportation, but also used for uh, plowing fields. And, and it was really the workhorse of that time frame. So when he developed a steam engine, he was trying to sell it to people who were used to horses um, doing the work for them. So he came up with a, uh, a conversion to horsepowers compared to the watt which at the time was just joules per second. We honor him with the term now. Um, the horsepower is converted into watts. One horsepower is 746 watts. And what we 
uh, can do is at the time he used it to compare his engine to how many horses it would um, outperform. And what he did is he took horses and, and had them uh, work in the field or move from point A to point B, and he figured out what an average horse could do in terms of its power output, the work divided by time, and then he used that to scale his engine when he was coming up with the steam engine. So now we have the horsepower, which is 746 watts. Most engines that you'll use today, from a lawnmower engine to a car engine, will be listed in horsepowers. And what you'll be able to do now is convert it into the metric unit of the watt. So 746 watts is one horsepower. You can actually determine whether or not you are a horse. If you were to run up a flight of stairs and time how long it takes to get up there, you could figure out the work done. It's no different than lifting your body up that set of stairs. So all you need to know is your force of gravity, because you have to overcome that, and how high the set of stairs are. And you multiply those two values, force times distance, to get your work. If you run up this flight of stairs and time how long it takes, you can divide the work, which is going to be consistent for your body, and that set of stairs, by the time. And if you get a value bigger than 746, you're a horse. So you can compare your output to a horse's output as well by just moving up a flight of stairs. So if you have a flight of, hair, if you have a flight of stairs handy and you have a stopwatch and you are going to do it in a safe manner, you can determine whether or not you are a horse. I think at this point we should do some practice problems dealing with power and horsepower, do some conversions. So let's get out the whiteboard and do some practice problems now. Thank you. Well, let's revisit the piano problem and just discuss it in terms of power. We already found that the work was the same for all three methods, which is 4,900 joules. But using method one, it only took two seconds. Method two, five seconds. And method three was 12 seconds. Now that's where the power will be different for all three methods. And if you remember, method one was lifting it straight up, method two was up a slight ramp, and method three was up a longer ramp. So power is work over time. Power is 4,900 joules over two seconds for the first one. So if I do 4,900 divided by two, I get 2,450 watts, which is the unit for power. Power for the second one, so it goes with that one. Power for the second one, work over time, 4,900 joules divided by 5 seconds, which gets me 980 watts. And then finally, Power equals 4,900 joules, 12 oh, over T. Well, we already have the, the unit, so let's just make it 12 seconds. And we'll say 4,900 divided by 12, 408.3 watts. So you'll see that although the work is the same for all three, the power is significantly different. Look at this. If work is constant, power and time are indirectly related. The shorter the time, the bigger the power. So there's an indirect relationship between the power and the time. So the quicker you do a task, the more power output you have. Okay, for this problem, we're going to have a box that we're going to push sideways. We have 5 kilograms in the box. We're pushing it with 30 newtons. There's gravity acting downward. There's a normal force going up. And because it mentioned that the box is made of steel and the table is made of steel, that's going to imply that there's friction. 
So this is going to be a good review problem uh, for friction, free body diagrams, and also power. Our ultimate goal is to find the power output by pushing this box, and it's the net power. The power forward and the power that friction is taking away would be the net power. So, force of gravity, 5 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared, 49 newtons. That's also the normal force, 49 newtons. Now friction, which we know as mu Fn, we have to find the mu. So steel on steel is 0 0.57 times 49. 0 0.57 times 49 I get 27.93. So we're barely uh, moving the box at all because there's so much friction. So the 30 newtons is barely moving the box. However, if I want to find the net force, I would say 30 newtons minus 27.93 newtons equals 5 kilograms times A, which is F equals MA. 30 minus 27.93 is 2.07 divided by 5. My acceleration is 0 0.414 meters per second squared. All right. Now, if I want to find the power output, what I'm going to need to do is the work over the time. Now the work is force times distance over the time. And what I'm going to look for is the network after 2.2 meters. So my net force was 30 minus 27.93 which got me 2.07. The distance is 2.2 meters. Now, the only thing I need to find is the time. Well, how can I do that? Well, I know that I start at rest. Unless it's stated otherwise, we start at rest. A is 0 0.414 meters per second squared. And D is 2.2 meters. So is there a way to find T? Well, it looks like equation 4. D equals VIT plus 1 half a t squared. 2.2 meters equals, that's gone, 1 half 0.414 t squared. So 2.2 divided by a half divided by 0.414. Take the square root. You get 3.26 seconds. So if I take that and plug in here, you do 2.07 times 2.2, and you divide it by 3.26. It's a way of a whopping 1.4 watts of power in this example problem. All right, in this next one, we're going to have a motor that's going to be lifting a paint can. So the paint is there and the motor is here. We have a power output of 150 watts, and the paint can has a mass of 7 kilograms. And it looks like that's all we're given. What we need to do is find the speed. Now, if we think about it, the force that's impl uh, implied in this case is the force due to gravity. If we're lifting the paint can, we're trying to overcome the force of gravity. So, what we can do is, remember, power is work over time, which is force times distance over time. And remember, distance over time is velocity. So what we can do is use the power that we have, 150 watts, 
equals the force I need to overcome is 7 kilograms times 9.8 and I can multiply that by V. So this becomes a fairly simple problem. 150 divided by the combination of 7 times 9.8. So I have parentheses there and I close them and my speed is 2.2 meters per second. And sometimes, although we have little bits of information, it allows us to still solve the problem. All right, this next problem involves a go-kart, and it's gonna move on a concrete track, and the tires are made of rubber, and we have a 25 horsepower motor. Now 25 horsepower immediately should be converted. One horsepower is 746 watts. And we get 25 times 746. And we have 18,650 watts. Now power is force times velocity. So we know the P. We're trying to find the velocity. But we need to figure out the force that we have to overcome. And in this case, we're not overcoming gravity. We're not going vertically. What we're doing instead is moving sideways. So the force that we're applying has to overcome friction. Now, how do we find the friction? Well, here's our free body diagram. This is going to be the force we look for. But remember, if we're going at a constant speed, the force is going to be equal to friction because these two forces are going to cancel out. It's going to be in a state of equilibrium in the x direction. Now, starting with the y, though, 68 times 9.8 is 666.4 newtons, which is also the same as the normal force. Now, the reason we needed that is because we have to find friction. Friction is mu fn. The mu for rubber on concrete is 0.68. So I'm going to have 0.68 times 666.4. So 0.68 times the answer I already had is 453.152 newtons. And I probably went a little too precise with that, but that's what I wrote. Now, the power is 18,650. The force I need to apply is 453.152 to keep it moving. And the V will be my answer. So 18,650 watts equals 453.152 newtons times V. So V becomes 18,650 divided by 453.152 and the top speed for this go-kart is 41.2 meters per second a little over 90 miles an hour so that's a pretty good go-kart now of course it's not going to be that efficient it's not going to produce that top speed and there'll be other forces involved other than just the frictional force between the tires and the ground so this is a theoretical problem, and that's how we would find the max speed of the go-kart, just looking at friction as the only force that opposes motion.